Mm. Oh my god. I made myself this pot roast last night. Stew? I don't know. It's wetter than what people usually call a pot roast. I have no idea what to call it. I stuck it in a crock pot and I roasted it. And it's, um, it's got chuck roast, beef broth, you know, your usual, um, like carrots, celery, onions, garlic, rosemary, sage, salt, and I included this, like, unflavored relight, um, electrolyte stuff because it needed more salt and um, I tried drinking the unflavored electrolyte stuff and it just tasted like drinking salt water. Um, so I put that in here and it's actually really good. Uh, and parsnips, I put parsnips as well. Oh and some potatoes as well, just kind of give it a little bit more like substance. It's really, really good. Uh, and some wine, there's wine in there. Mm. Oh my god. Orgasmic. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about books that changed my life. Um, and I have all except for one of the books that I'm going to talk about today as like a paper, like hard copy. So we'll get to that one in a moment. Um, but let's go ahead and just start by talking about the impact of books and the social responsibility that uh, creatives have. Um, when they are writing their stories. I think that it's really important that we, as creatives, understand the way that our books can be interpreted and, and can impact other people and culture, be that for better or for worse. The books that I'm about to talk about today, um, some of them do have high social impact, some of them you've probably never heard of, but all of them played a huge role in helping me grow up as a person. Um, and I, I made an intentional choice to choose books from different parts of my life. The books that we read at any age, but especially as young people, give us an insight into the world and impact the way that we understand and interact with the world and the people around us. And it's our responsibility as creatives to think about how our stories impact the people who are reading them. With that in mind, let's begin. The first book I want to talk about is Talking an Animal by Terry Farish. You've probably never heard of it. I had to go on a pretty, pretty crazy hunt to find this thing, actually. But it is a wonderful, wonderful book. It originally sold, as you can see here, for $15. I think I got this one for $7 online, which is pretty good. And let's go ahead and read The Inside Matter. Siobhan prefers dogs to people. That's what her mother says. All Siobhan knows is that communicating with animals seems easier than with humans. My autistic ass gravitated to this book. Gravitated. Like, I saw the title in these, like, pink, you know, talking animal letters, and it was like, that's the book. That's the book I need to read right now. Lo and behold, it was not about learning how to talk an animal. But, nevertheless, I checked it out every week, and I read it over and over and over again, just absorbing everything I could from the pages here and the subtext, right? Her mother and Maddie, Siobhan's only human friend, are arguing on opposite sides of a school board issue on condoms, and the new girl, Lester, keeps trying to communicate with Siobhan, but Siobhan isn't sure she wants to be friends with her. Siobhan's brilliant, beautiful dog, Tree, seems to be the only one who understands her. Things in Siobhan's life are changing whether or not she wants them to, but Maddie, Lester, and Siobhan can talk about cats, dogs, and wolves, and they talk an animal about love, loss, and courage in this rich, heartfelt novel. So my personal notes on this one kind of reflect that. Um, the story is set in New Hampshire and focuses on Siobhan's dream of one day raising collies and her emotional struggles as her beloved dog becomes increasingly ill. Sorry, spoilers, there's gonna be spoilers for all these books. Um, Siobhan finds solace in helping her neighbor Maddie care for injured wildlife. Maddie's newfound religious beliefs create tension, particularly regarding issues like contraception. So, as you can imagine, my experience as like a Bible-thumping, evangelical, um, Christian white nationalist baby, child, uh, fetus, reading this book gave me a huge dose of perspective that didn't really fully set in uh, until much, much, much later in life. But I just kept coming back to this one being like, man, there's, there's something in here. 
And I think that this now has kind of like culminated, the ideas from this book have sort of like simmered and um, distilled down into my own personal goals of trying to find common ground and trying to humanize and personalize um, all of us, regardless of our, you know, position on the political spectrum, especially when polarized, and using that to combat extremism, using that to combat the black and white thinking that so often ruins relationships. This book that I read in seventh grade, every week of the school year, is, I think, a huge credit to that. This book is something that impacted me so much that I feel now the sort of core tenets of the story as part of my core values. So autistic me who was drawn to this book and who fell in love with Newfoundlands uh, as a result, over time synthesized and made the connections that this book is really trying to impart to people my age when I was, you know, reading this book, um, but also to adults. And so I would recommend everybody get your hands on this book. Is it a little slow at times? Is it a little bit dry? Does it feel a little bit meandering and subtexty? Yes. Um, and if you're like me, that can be frustrating, but stick with it. It's worth the read. The next one is, where are you at? House of the Scorpion by Nancy Farmer. I don't have a physical copy with me. I have it on Kindle, I have it on Audible. I've also read the sequel, which was released um, really recently, about 10 years after the original. You can find them anywhere books are sold. This was actually prescribed reading by one of my teachers. It was on a list of book options, and that was the one that uh, called me to it. It is a phenomenal story. I have read it uh, six times, maybe seven. So let's talk about it. Oh, spoilers. There will always be spoilers, so just be aware. Dystopian novel that follows Matt, a young clone of the powerful drug lord El Patron, set in a futuristic society between the United States and a drug-ruled territory called Opium. The story explores themes of identity, ethics, and the morality of cloning. Matt grows up isolated, treated as both a human and a monster, while he navigates his purpose and freedom in a world controlled by a ruthless benefactor. The novel raises questions about human rights, power, and survival. I think you could actually like extend The House of the Scorpion to talk about uh, things like gender identity, uh, racism, um, fear of immigration, uh, colonialism, hyper-wealth versus uh, poorness and like a feudalist society and what that looks like. Uh, late capitalism. There is a lot encompassed in this book and there's a reason why it won an award. Actually, I'm gonna pull up which award it won. Right, so it won the John Newberry Medal in 2003 and the National Book Award for Young People in 2002. When I say it's an iconic book, I really mean it. Please, please, please read this book. For me, uh, reading that book as a, again, a middle schooler, I definitely gained a perspective that I hadn't really like been able to put into words of um, feeling like an outcast and feeling, well, you know, like a mutant, like a, an untouchable, and also was able to identify like my views of other people as untouchables due to like the Christian way that I was raised. And I was able to apply that to things like immigration, to things like racism, and in later years, I was able to read that and, and think about human rights and how are we approaching people's basic rights to, and when I say basic, I mean human rights, not like Bill of Rights, but people's basic right to, you know, food and shelter and community. And also was able to look at like the way that power imbalances impact our different um, relationships. And it's also just like a really compelling narrative. It's really well written and the audible form is uh, also really well narrated. If you also read the sequel, I mean, it's a little bit of a different writing style. You can tell that it's been a while since the original was written, but the story is cohesive and it, it wraps it up really nicely. You will find yourself crying at the end. So yeah, that's another book that just like really changed my life. So next we have The 5th of March, which again, something I read in middle school. So let's read the back matter. It's 1770 and 14 year old Rachel Marsh is a servant in the Boston household of John Adams, known maniac. It doesn't say that on here though. That's just me 
<laughs> but her loyalty to the Adams family is tested by her friendship with Matthew Kilroy, a British private with an unsavory reputation. Rachel knows Matthew is frustrated and angry, but even she is surprised when he is accused of joining soldiers and firing upon a mob of citizens in the bloody encounter that came to be known as the Boston Massacre. This book, I want you to know, this is the book that I got when I was in eighth grade as, as part of the reading assignment. This is the book that I read and read and read. Look, I've even got dog ears on pages that I thought were like important. Smells like middle school. Um, so I will be honest, I haven't read this one uh, since high school but it was so impactful that I have yet to get rid of it. Um, this is one of the books that inspired me to actually start writing, like writing, writing, and like forming storylines um, and exploring counter narratives. Uh, subtly, but still um, really addresses kind of the theme of terrorism in the revolution and the uh, concept of challenging power and it addresses, it like doesn't really fully address it, more like ask the question of like, where is the line? How extreme is too extreme? How far is too far? And again, same with talking an animal, um, just talking about how like humans are humans, like we're all people, regardless of what side we're on, we're all human beings. Um, and it's really, really important to remember that, especially in times of conflict. Yeah, and so let's see, here are my notes. It explores themes of independence, duty, the impact of political events on ordinary people. Um, Rachel's personal growth, the looming revolution, and how that infects, uh, affects the communities there. Sorry, these are not great notes, I just did kind of like um, bullet points here. And then the Boston Massacre itself becomes a pivotal moment in Rachel's life for obvious reasons, but then also um, it forces her to like reckon with her beliefs about justice and freedom. Um, and it really talks about like the complexities of life in colonial Britain. I think that a similar book talking about the non-white perspective of colonial Britain would also be really useful. Also, this is a romance or like adjacent to romance. I don't really read romance uh, anymore. It used to be like my bread and butter when I was a lot younger. I just remember really reading through and being like, wow, like this is, I mean, I, I have like snippets of memories in my mind of reading this book, which as a person who doesn't remember a lot of my life, that means that it probably played a huge role in kind of forming who I am. Also, John Adams, when I read the book at the time, John Adams was absolutely like an idol of mine because again, like white Christian nationalism and like extremist Christian beliefs. Now I understand that he's a maniac. So I am interested in reading this again and seeing how I perceive John Adams now and how I understand his actions now versus when I first read the book. Yeah, super interesting. I don't remember if I showed you the cover, but this is it. I think it's a pretty timeless cover, pretty classic. And here's the, I'll just throw that on the ground. And here's the back cover, of course. So next on the list was something that I got for Christmas called The Dark is Rising. Unbeknownst to me, it's a sequel. I actually haven't read the original. I just remember reading this initially and being like so, feeling confused, like being like, what is going on in this book? I feel like there's something I missed. Um, and it's just because, uh, <laughs> it's just because I didn't read the, read the original uh, book. I do plan to actually um, listen to both of them on Audible. I'm sure there's actually a whole series, and if there is, I will read the whole thing. But let's go ahead and read the back matter here. Of course, here's the cover. Um, Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising sequence has sold more than 2 million copies in hardcover and paperback. Now the second book in the sequence, the Newbery Honor book, The Dark is Rising, has been adapted to the screen as a live-action film with an impression inter impressing international cast. I don't think that movie actually did very well. I need to find it. Of course, it's got the www.darkthemovie.com, uh, which I bet you doesn't exist anymore. Let's look it up. Yeah, doesn't exist anymore. Kind of crazy to see stuff like that go where where it goes, which is um, vanishing into the ether. Right, so this is a fantasy novel. Uh, I think that it is probably a middle grade novel, although it might, it might be a little older age, but I think middle grade is probably where I would classify it, especially based off of the size of the text. So it's about a guy who discovers on his birthday that he's um, a 
like part of a group of ancient powerful beings dedicated to fighting the forces of the dark. Um, of course, as a like Christian, I was initially drawn to this, but it introduces like a whole bunch of different non-Christian lore that I absolutely love. Arthurian legends, British folklore, and it's just, it's a really good coming of age story. It talks about responsibility and um, I even put here identity as a young boy. Um, I'm not saying this is the childhood that I wish I had, <laughs> obviously, but as a kid who didn't feel like I related to any female protagonist that wasn't hyper-masculine or lesbian-coded or whatever, I really felt a connection to the main character in this book, Will, and I'll be honest, like, the concept of having all of this sudden, like, big responsibility as you grow up really resonated with me um, being a kid in a house where my dad was always working and my mom was always sick um, and really feeling like I was the caretaker and I had, like, grown into these, like, big responsibilities. Um, and it really, like, I don't know, placated this desire in me to feel like I'm part of something more. And this one actually did inspire in part the events of my book series that I never published, never really finished. Um, the Realms series, the first book was um, called The Hooded Boy. Actually, the, the first book that I started writing in the series was Lone Wolf, the story of Luke Kyle, which reflects some of the events here uh, a little too similarly. So this one impacted me in terms of just kind of like feeling more close to my identity uh, as a guy, as a boy, right, a young boy, and then, of course, uh, just inspired my own sort of writing approach to uh, otherworldly crossings over into our life uh, as humans in the quote-unquote real world. Next is the Major Gears trilogy. This is not the original book that I had, uh, not the original version. Um, I actually, like, was kind of like play partners, fuck buddies with the guy who wrote this book series, and my ex-husband made me get rid of, like, everything that I had from him because I was still, like, super smitten with the guy. We're still friends now, but things are a lot different. So why do I have a book series written by a past lover in my, uh, series of books that changed my life? This experience of reading this book, watch these books, of watching him write and of sitting, you know, in cafes and pizza parlors and, you know, libraries, etc., writing with him, like, he's over here writing and I'm over here writing, we're both working on our stuff, really helped solidify the idea that I can publish my own stuff. Like, I can write books that people want to read. And I can publish those things. And it introduced me to steampunk in a way that I hadn't really like been introduced before. I also helped him, uh, I helped a man his book selling booth at Steamathon where I met one of my other friends, Mark, who I'm still in touch with today. And it just gave me like a sense of community. And then of course, just reading the books, like they're really good books, <laughs> you know? Like I am surprised that this didn't end up gaining like any like significant traction. I'm done, like, sucking this book's dick. Let's actually talk about, like, what's in it. So, um, Vikings, Cowboys, Airships, welcome to the Gears and Gunfighters universe where Gearsmen can defy death and steam horses gallop across the frontier. Shootout at Relumit Ridge, Mystery of the Crimson Gear, and Clock at the End of the World are all in this, in this like, omnibus, as he called it. When a gunfight brings the bordered town of Relumit Ridge to the brink of chaos, it is up to a few well-meaning citizens to restore the peace before the mayor and the Viking chieftain seize the opportunity to plunge the region into war, the arrival of a legendary outlaw and his beautiful companion steepen the stakes and set the town on rails for a confrontation that could destroy the fragile peace between the Union of the Americas and the sworn territories. Can order be restored before the clock runs out? And then, you know, the sequel and, uh, sequel, sequel, follow that same storyline. This book introduced me to alternate histories, which I didn't know was, like, a thing that you could do in books. Um, it inspired my own steampunk book, which hasn't been published yet, but is, um, 
just sort of like an adventure, like Indiana Jones style book. I'm rewriting it for a middle grade audience because I think it'll do really well. But it's fast paced, it's got really good world building. Uh, really encouraged me to build my own worlds. I would say probably was the seed that spawned uh, the Iraq Apocalypse universe and some of the other universes that I've written. And yeah, I really like the steampunk vibes. So another book that just kind of changed my life. Man, I am really hungry right now. All right, so this last one. This last one is gonna surprise you. It's a nonfiction. It is a textbook. It is Essentials of Biological Anthropology. And I got this book as a result of my enrollment in Arizona State University's Anthropology Bachelor's Degree Program. I wish that I could return to it. It is too expensive for me currently to pay for. This changed my life because starting when I started attending the school in 2019, um, I got to learn about how evolution actually works, how biology actually works, and genetics, variation, sorry I'm looking at my notes here, the fossil record, genomics, race as a concept, as being kind of like a useless concept. Um, <laughs> all of that really helped me be able to combat a lot of what I had been raised with growing up in terms of uh, evolution being a pseudoscience and creationism kind of being the, the only true way to understand how the world came into being, which is great because then I was able to and am continuing to be able to combat things like young earth creationism and general creationist ideology and the distasteful likes of Ken Ham. My family, unfortunately, a lot of them do believe in young earth creationism. They do believe that any sort of scientific dating methods are inaccurate and do not seem to understand some of the most basic con like concepts such as uh, the heat problem, for example. If you want to learn more about that, check out Gutsick Gibbons' uh, channel. I'll go ahead and link it in the description below. She definitely is doing, uh, I'm gonna say, quote unquote, the Lord's work, but I mean that sarcastically, in sort of undoing a lot of the harm that Young Earth Creationism is doing just by uh, disproving it unequivocally. So yeah, that is, uh, the list of books that have changed my life, and I hope you check them all out. I hope you give them all a read. Um, if any of these have impacted you, of course, I want to hear about it. Give me a comment. And of course, if uh, you have books that you feel like should be listed, or you think that I should read, or you think I would enjoy based off of my list here, definitely um, go ahead and just leave a comment. I am super interested in adding stuff to my TV Red pile, which is currently sitting over here. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for watching, and uh, if you like what you saw today, my cat needs to scratch, I guess. If you like what you saw today and you want to see more, hit that button down below, subscribe, become a member of the Are We Jackalope Tribe, Are We Littercast Clan, let me know what you think in the comments, which one you think works best, um, and uh, I will see you next time.